of African American men who um, were seeking public office and were being elected into Congress, and it was it was fascinating. And then all of a sudden, that just ended. And I thought about the same type of dynamic with her father, mm -hmm. because here he was a freed. I mean, was he officially was he officially a slave? Mm -hmm. Was he? And he was incredibly entrepreneurial. It was almost like once the, the floodgates opened and you could see the type of possibility. Now granted, he, his father helped him become educated in the world of business, but it's almost like when you see what's possible, you just take the reins and then that all can just change in an instant because of, in an instant, because of laws. So I think I think once you have a taste of that, and I think there was some of that with Mrs. Terrell. I mean, she went to Oberlin. She was living in, in some respects, in this bubble where, you know, I mean, here she is, this really cultured woman, and she can't eat at some dumpy diner because she's, you know, she's black. And, and so, you know, she, one of the things I read in her journal was that she, when she was working a municipal job, here she is fluent in at least three languages, and this woman, this white woman, who is her superior, who isn't that bright apparently, is treating her horribly. <coughs> and I think it was that, you know, this disconnect between I am supposed to be her subordinate and she can barely put a sentence together and she's my superior. I think, um, I think that can do a number on you. Absolutely. And I think it can motivate you also. And so do you want to? Du Bois said that to, to, to describe Reconstruction, the Negro stood for a brief moment in the sun and then receded back into the shadows. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. progress that had been made after the Civil War uh, discomfited racists. And there is a man named Senator John Tyler Morgan who said in the Congress, in the US Capitol, basically, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to join my fellow members and because we are sickened at the sight of black people voting in the district, we're going to take the franchise away from everybody. So that um, every white man, uh, regardless of how much money he had or much, how much influence, we're going to take the vote away from him because we've got to get, here we go, we've got to get rid of this quote unquote load of Negro suffrage. And so one of the senators sitting next to him said, you mean this is like burning down the whole barn to get rid of the rats? And Senator Morgan said, yes. So they were, they were willing. Now, this, this it was not going to be accepted. It, they weren't going to hold hands and have a come by ya moment. This was a raw power relationship by which any technique, no matter how bloody, no matter how <laughs> underhanded, to keep black people in a certain place was going to be resorted to. As the folk told me last night at Woodridge Library, it's still that way today. <laughs> so yes, I, I do. I, I certainly do. Mm -hmm. Particularly when it regards to voting mm -hmm. and how in South Carolina, I'm sorry, Georgia, the man is running for office who's in charge yes. of keeping track of the votes. Uh -huh. that, that is madness beyond mm -hmm. all measure. Mm -hmm. That's right. And how a lot of black people can't vote. Yes. They have yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they've extended the uh, lines, I guess, the di for districts, <laughs> giving Republicans larger reign over the vote. Mm -hmm. so, so a lot going on that they're mm -hmm. keeping away from us, so you do have to do your research. Stay alert, young folk. Stay alert. While you're up here, mm -hmm. stay alert and stay focused. We want you to get that education, but remain alert so that you can take your education back to your communities and help transform them for the good of everyone. Mm -hmm. Do you want to add something, Joan? Oh, she's had her. Uh, I always think of that image uh, at Harper's Ferry, the women assembled at Harper's Ferry right after Plessy versus Ferguson from the Supreme Court said, okay, so we're going to have segregated railway cars. That's going to be legal now. Um, I think just of the the dignity and the raw emotional uh, resonance of going to that place two months after the Supreme Court's decision and saying, we are here. 
we are women, we are African American, we are activists. Um, that photograph to me just says so much. Mm -hmm. Did you, um, Jacqueline, did you? Oh yes, please. I would like to give thanks to the filmmakers of Hamilton and uh, the illustrious body. Um, I'd also like to be very specific in that it's less than 150 years that we've had the national vote of men in this country since September of 1870, um, men as a whole. One of the reasons why she may not be as well known, sometimes you have to look in your own backyard. Men who follow other men in terms of patrilineal-ism or patriarchal-ism. And then when you have women who follow those men 180 degrees in the inappropriate direction, the woman and the women, actually, who that film was about, she was not that kind of a woman. Um, I belong and I practice with what is called the Nanny Helen Burroughs Project. The generation of uh, Mary Church Terrell is actually a teacher of that generation. Nanny Helen Burroughs graduated in 1896 from the M Street School. And so a lot of times we be looking externally in terms of what is the major problem. Too often if we look in our own backyard, we have found out that the major negative contradiction too often ends up in my own backyard. What do I mean? In 1875, not to be so constitutionally, but that was the open accommodation. And for some of us, Mary Church Terrell perhaps was using that and some other statutes according to the Constitution. And the NAACP Legal Defense Fund decided to use some other things, even though it was later on in 1934 formally. So we have to look and see what was the tactics and what was the strategies of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and who were the pushers and movers? That's like they said they wanted integration. We who are very strong Southerners, we wanted desegregation because we were taxpayers. Taxpayers. And so integration for some of us was a soft pedal. It was segregated. We wanted it to be desegregated. And this is it's really interesting. You cannot allow other people to define what you are to do. And Mary Church, to, because when I was thinking about the Colored Women Association and the young women who are in here, as well as young men, and the Colored Women Association on 16th and R Street, they are slowly dying because most of the women there are 75 years of age. How do we protect that institution today? How do we protect the National Council of Negro Women? We can be at Howard University, we can be at UDC discussing, and we should. But how do we get membership mm -hmm. into those institutions where these young women and young men can assist those people at 16th and R Street? What can that be done? Mm -hmm. And how can that be done? Except by doing it. Thank you, thank you very much. I see she's been very patient too in the back, the student. Um, oh. So I had a question regarding like, what, would, what do you think that her views of what's happening now with like the Me Too movement and the Black Lives Matter, how do you think that she would feel about it? Would she like approve of the methods? Would she like agree and would she like support? That's a really good question because I, I thought about that when I was doing my research. Um, you know, especially when her grandson said that uh, their form of protest was everybody was dressed impeccably and everybody just presented themselves in a way that was 
quiet and yet dignified, I think that she would still be very, very supportive of the movement. I think she would see anything that would push equality forward for everyone, I think she would be supportive of that. I, I, I really do. But, but your, your thoughts, did you hear the, I don't know if you heard no, the question. No, no, I didn't. She asked what, um, what would she think today of the Me Too movement and the Black Lives Matter movement, and would she, would she give her stamp of approval? I'll let you think about it, Joan. Did you want to answer that first? Uh, I've thought about it too, and it is a great question. Um, and I think I, I agree with, with what Robin said, that she would approve of any effort that was about uh, advancement of the cause of equality. It was important to her to be dignified, uh, and uh, that's also sort of the Gandhian, mm -hmm. the nonviolent civil uh, disobedience protest. She was very much part of that too. Um, and still a feminist, so it's hard to imagine she would not have support for me too. Right. Um, Did you want to? I think she would as, as well. If you are familiar with the writings of Anna Julia Cooper and A Voice from the South, um, she talks about too long have others spoken for us. I mean, it, it's clear. All right, Brother Oduno. Um, the point is, is that more and more of these successful black women wanted to speak out. And, and that wasn't simply limited to the best educated. We, we know that there were working class women as, as well who chafed under patriarchy. They, you know, and, and it was a tough pill for many of them to swallow. So I think that they would be uh, um, delighted at, at, at hashtag me too. And they'd be hashtagging away. <laughs> Uh, we have time for just two more questions. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, Jacqueline, we'll follow your lead. Um, hi, my name's Ania Centers. I'm a freshman in political science and economics double major from Tatum, Texas. Um, my question, I guess you kind of touched on it on the film, like that her husband held a public office somewhere that he kind of, he kind of was restrained in a certain mm -hmm. way. Do you feel like that restraint of him needing appointments, needing approval from the public, restrained her in a way, kept her from, from pushing as hard as she would have, or even him pushing as hard as he would have? Like, do you think that held them back in any way? Or do you think it just had it where they just changed directions, or if they moved forward, or if, they, or if it made it where they couldn't do things that they probably would have done had he not had that position? That's a really good question. That's a great question. I think that, um, I definitely think it, it held him back in some way. Just from my, from my research, he had to be so, so careful. And to even be um, appointed during Woodrow Wilson, who was, I mean, the worst. Right. Um, just to even be able to do that, I think he really, really had to hold his tongue. For her, I don't know. I mean, because I do feel like she was pretty outspoken. Um, if, if she ever felt the need to hold back, I think it was, I think it was out of deference to him. You, you know what I mean? But, but what, what were your thoughts? Uh, he definitely checked himself. Uh, there were times, there were a few times when he gave speeches and addressed the images. I remember one speech he gave before he became ill, so it must have been the sort of 1919, maybe it was even after the race riot here in Washington. Uh, but he had to, he had to pick and choose. She did too. She was conscious of um, his position in the community as a judge, and she liked that he had that position, but she checked herself less. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can add nothing, nothing to that. That's certainly, and, it, and it's, it's real politics. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you're going to go out so far on the edge that your husband falls off? No, but you're going to keep mindful that you have an underlying mission that, that you both share. And I think she worked within the confine, reasonable confines of that relationship. Yeah. Final question? One more, yeah, final question, anyone? Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> More on Spingon Research Center. Oh, yes. My name is Richard <laughs> Jenkins. And I'm alluding to the fact that the reason why um, they didn't know anything about Mary Church Terrell, because like Brother Duna just is a somewhat a sexist um, portrayal of um, the civil rights movement, because most of the major figures throughout the 
history of civil rights for males, not female. There was no emphasis on females. You did have a few like Rosa Parks and Fannie Lou Hamer, but I'm gonna plug, give a plug for some other people like Anna, Anna Julia Cooper. She lived right down the way from mm -hmm. Mary Church Terrell. Because LaJoy Park is a very historical district. You know, you had some professors that lived there. You had um, Dean Paul Lawrence Dunbar lived in the community and Walter Washington, our first black elected mayor. And I think Jesse Jackson has a house. Well, I don't know if he still has a house. But anyway, I'm gonna name some other names, like um, Eva Dykes. She was the first African-American woman to get a PhD from Harvard, well, it was Rad known as Radcliffe. Mm -hmm. and, and also, I'm gonna make a sidebar on the, the Terrell Square. They have cat-lit <coughs> sculptors in that, mm -hmm. in the, in the lobby of the building. So I thought that was interesting also. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, there's so much history because I was just wondering about the, the house. Um, why is it in such bad shape? Because, you know, for the same thing that happened to the Woodson house because it took so long for the park service to yeah. finally motivate and, you know, renovate mm -hmm. the building. So there's, there's, there's so much resource, financial resources you can get behind these developers and say, well, if you do this, I hate to say dealing with certain people, but you can make a deal with the developer, say, if you do this for us, you can do this for something else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's my take of it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, my name is Susan Kelly, and I'm working with a group of people, oh, sorry, thank you who are trying to create a museum or slash learning center for Alma Thomas. Um, Alma Thomas was a, the first art graduate of Howard University. Uh, she taught at Shaw Junior High School for 35 years, taught art. And she is really become, I mean, recognized now as one of the our countries and maybe the world's great artists. <laughs> And um, so we, we're making some progress with trying to get this museum going, but she lived in this neighborhood. She lived on 15th Street most of her life and, um, you know, was very active in this community. So, um, and maybe someday we'll have a, um, you know, a, a film, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's my next project. Uh -huh. <laughs> Well, thank you everybody for coming. And this was just such a, it was a treat for me. I feel very fortunate to have um, Sierra and Joan here as well, but we hope you enjoyed it. It was, it was wonderful to even still talk about her. So thank you again for everything. And good luck. Yes. Good luck. Oh, and one more thing I forgot to say. I really wanted to say thank you to um, Earl Watkiss, Mr. Watkiss, who's on, on camera now. He really orchestrated all this. He did a beautiful job. So let's give a hand to him. Yes, we did. Thank you. Oh my God. Jones, oh, good to see you. It was a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh.